Hello everyone, welcome again. So today we're going to be looking at the cathodic protection process. So we're going to look at how we can protect um, metal objects like steel um, that may be exposed to corrosion from, uh, from corrosion through the use of cathodic protection. Okay, so we'll look at what that actually is. And so you can see big steel pipe um, dug into the ground. We don't want that pipe corroding, so we have to protect it somehow. So we, um, we, use, we can use this cathodic protection. Okay, so what is it? So cathodic protection is the process at which the corrosion is halted by making the steel, or whatever metal in this case, but we'll consider a steel, um, a, ca a cathode in a galvanic cell. So we want the steel to be the reducing electrode of, the, of a galvanic cell. So this is achieved by placing electrons on the steel structure. Okay, so um, ordinarily, what would happen is oxygen would attack the carbon, or the, the iron, sorry, grab electrons from it and turn it into Fe plus, right? Some kind of Fe ion, some iron ion, okay? So instead, what we're going to do is we need to get something that can pump electrons onto the, the iron surface, and then that will protect it from, um, from corrosion. So because it has electrons pumped onto it, it is the cathode. So you just got to remember that. So since the cathode is the site of reduction, any iron that oxidizes will be instantly be reduced back into iron. So if an iron atom gets reduced by an oxygen atom or oxygen molecule, because there's so many electrons on the surface, uh, on the steel structure, the iron ion that formed will instantly be reduced back into pure iron. Uh, pure iron. Okay? Additionally, water can be reduced before it can damage the steel structure. So because there's electrons on the steel, any water that's on top of it can actually be reduced into oxygen and um, hydrogen or other chemicals. And we can actually stop it from hurting the iron before it even starts. Okay? So how do we do this? Well, we use sacrificial anodes. So if there's a cathode, there's got to be an anode. Just like if there's dark, there's got to be a light. So it's got to be the other side. So cathodic protection can occur via sacrificial anodes. There are other methods for cath cathodic protection, which I'll go through, but this is the first one. Okay? We need to find a sacrificial anode. So we get a reactive metal like zinc or magnesium, something more reactive than the thing we want to protect. It's like, so in this case, zinc and magnesium are more reactive than iron. And we submerge it in the electrolyte. Okay? So for instance, if you've got a ship that you're sending through the ocean, it's sitting in an electrolyte um, solution of salt water. But you want to protect the ship steel from being corroded. So what you do is you connect, you drop a zinc or magnesium anode into the water and connect it electrically to the hull of the ship. And then it, that forms like a complete electrical circuit and that helps to protect the steel ship. Okay? So the reactive metal oxidizes, producing electrons. So this reactive metal gives away its electrons, um, which will then be pushed onto the steel surface that you want to protect. Okay? So in this case, the steel ship. Okay? And that creates a cathode. So assuming there's iron, if the iron oxidizes, the electrons from the anode reduce the iron, the, we'll say Fe, the Fe ions, forming solid iron again. So it'll just, the Fe atom will become Fe ion but then it'll be instantly turned back into Fe um, atom. Okay? So we don't have to worry about the steel. And obviously this prevents corrosion, because if we can't get any Fe ions, we can't bond them to other things, which would cause rust or corrosion. And so we just have just the plain steel again. For a zinc anode, assuming some iron has oxidized, we've got basically the oxidation reaction is zinc solid goes to zinc 2 plus, plus 2 electrons. Okay. Now the redu so remember that we assumed that some of, it, some of the iron had oxidized already. So the Fe ions grab the two electrons and become solid iron again. Okay. So back to steel, essentially. For a magnesium anode, assuming no iron has oxidized, so the iron is still intact, but the, the magnesium anode does this. It goes from magnesium solid 
to magnesium 2 plus, plus 2e, 2 electrons. And so the reduction is slightly more complicated. It's now oxygen gas plus water plus 4 electrons becomes 4 OH minus. Okay, so instead of re like reducing the Fe ions back into Fe solid, because none of that's happened yet, we actually reduce the water and oxygen into OH minus instead. Okay? So because those electrons have to go somewhere, um, that's what happens. That's the reaction that occurs. Okay? So the choice of the anode. Both magnesium and zinc can be used um, as the sacrificial anode. So here is some zinc, and here is the magnesium strip that you're very familiar with by now. Choice of which material is pretty much just based on the operating environment. Magnesium and zinc can be used in different circumstances more effectively than the other one. So in sort of marine type applications, so like I said in the ship situation where you want to throw um, a sacrificial anode over the side um, to protect your ship hull, zinc is the preferred um, material. For things like pipes underground, um, where it's very hard to get access to them. Um, magnesium is more often used. Um, so magnesium tends to be used for situations like pipes underground, and zinc tends to be used for the marine type applications. So increasingly we're getting situations where we can see um, magnesium, zinc, and aluminium, alloys of them, so mixtures of them, being used as the sacrificial anode um, instead of just a singular element. So we can actually mix them together and get um, sacrificial anodes um, uh, as well as just using them by themselves. It is important to note that there must be a sufficiently conductive medium between the anode and cathode for this process to occur. Okay, this is really, really important because if you don't have a conducting medium, you're not going to get any electrical movement so you're not going to be able to, um, to get a circuit, which means that you can't um, pump those electrons to where you need them to be. So for instance, in the marine application, there's a seawater. Um, there's a seawater electrolyte, which basically says, which basically allows um, ions to pass between two places. In the wet terrestrial environment, there's probably enough um, ions in the soil to actually allow um, for allow it to be conductive enough for this um, sacrificial anode process to happen. Um, if you don't believe me in terms of there's uh, ions in the ground, um, they used to actually send phone signals um, through the ground because it, the ground was actually suitably conductive where they could send phone signals along um, and people could call each other through the ground essentially. Okay. Now, if you don't want to just keep throwing away zinc because um, I don't know, zinc might become very precious in the future. There's impressed cathodic protection, uh, impressed current cathodic protection. So this is the alternative to the sacrificial anode system. So in this case, a DC power supply generates electrons and forces them onto the steel structure. So instead of using like some kind of zinc or magnesium thing that will eventually wear away, we get like a little power generation uh, device and pump electrons onto the steel structure using that power generation device. It could be a photovoltaic cell or a solar cell, or it could be um, you know, just a normal generator or something like that. And these electrons do exactly the same thing as um, in the sacrificial case. They prevent the corrosion of the iron by reducing any iron ions or reducing the water and oxygen. So an anode is placed below the water line to complete the circuit. So as you can see in this picture, this is our structure, the white one. This is our generator, DC power supply. Um, red is the positive side, black is the negative side. So the electrons are being pushed onto this because it's connected to this. And then the red positive cable is connected to just some electrode in the water. Okay? And that's how you get protection. That's how you get the protection from this impressed current system. Now the cool thing about this one is that the choice of electrode here is arbitrary. You can pick whatever you want. You can pick steel, aluminium, um, titanium, any, anything. The only constraint is that it has to be suitably conductive. So you can't pick plastic, which is unfortunate. Okay, so 
you just got to make sure you pick something, some conductive metal. Um, you could pick one that doesn't dissolve. So you could pick like gold if you really wanted to. Um, and then you could have a like an eternal cathode, uh, anode on this side. So it doesn't matter which one you pick. So we often pick the anode to be a, an inert metal. So we don't have to keep replacing it essentially. So it's just a maintenance issue. Whatever you pick here, you mainly pick because it doesn't degrade. So it could be um, something like, uh, probably not gold, but something suitably unreactive. Okay. This means that the water is, on, is the only chemical to undergo any reaction. So in this case, the water undergoes reaction rather than um, uh, the anode itself. So on the anode side, the oxidation reaction is two waters turns to form oxygen gas plus hydrogen ions and um, some electrons. Okay. The reduction reaction is the same; is very similar to what we had before, um, except in this case we're generating hydrogen and two OH rather than just OH. So two water molecules plus the electrons goes to form hydrogen gas and 2OH minus, okay? So those are the two ways that we can get um, cathodic protection. We've looked at sacrificial anode system and the cathodic protection, uh, impressed current cathodic protection. So hopefully that helps you understand what, um, what types and how we protect steel in our industry. Um, and so we'll go through some questions and hopefully that will consolidate some of the knowledge. So iron pylons may be partly in water and partly buried in a wet terrestrial environment. Which alternative describes the most suitable cor corrosion protection for this purpose? Okay. So regularly apply sacrificial anodes to areas in both air and water. This will protect the entire surface or the entire structure. So apply a small current to the whole structure. An compressed current system will carry through to all parts. So this might actually be the best way to do it because remember that different sacrificial anodes are used in different um, situations. So supply an impressed current um, to the underground parts, but protect the exposed areas with a sacrificial anode. Um, that seems like too uh, extra work. It seems like a lot of extra work. So use sacrificial anodes on exposed areas. Um, underground areas don't need protection. They're not exposed to O2. Okay, that could probably, that might be the case, but it seems unlikely. Okay, so C is the correct answer. We supply an impressed current to the underground parts because um, they're probably the hardest to get access to. But we also have to protect the exposed areas, which is the um, partly buried in wet terrestrial environment and partly in water. Um, we have to ex protect the, express the exposed parts with the sacrificial anode. So what are the major disadvantages of the impressed current system? Okay, we need a power supply. Okay. In the case of a sort of solar cell, probably that's not too bad, but we do require some form of infrastructure in order to power this device. Uh, failure is more likely due to the high number of components. That's again probably true compared to a sacrificial anode system. However, with you know solar cells um, and that kind of thing, it's probably not as good as bad a situation as it used to be. And maintenance and operational costs are higher than sacrificial anodes. Um, again, that's probably in the short term. In the long term, you probably make a lot of savings because you don't have to buy big chunks of zinc or magnesium. So, but generally, you would use them because they, you have access to a power supply and you don't have access to zinc, for instance. When would impressed current systems be preferred over sacrificial anode systems? I guess I kind of touched on that in the last question, so we'll look at it more closely now. So it's when the, current, when the protected metal is in a location that's not easy to access, okay? We can't get access to it. Um, that's when we want to use impressed current. Uh, another situation would be the cost of replacing anodes would be high in the sacrificial case. So for instance, if you know, you're a trade, um, trade restricted country that can't get zinc or magnesium, but you have access to power generation, then um, it might be very costly to get these sacrificial anodes. So we will be better to use the impressed current system because we have access to electricity. Okay, so it's more of an economic thing than anything else. 
So it's in an area that cannot readily access the required metals or alloys. Again, this is sort of um, related to this one. Um, replacing anodes would be very difficult, for instance, if you had to dig out the ground all the time. So for instance, underground pipes. You don't want to be digging them out just to replace the anodes every five years or whatever. So it's probably better to have um, impressed current simply because you don't have to replace them as much. So compare and contrast the sacrificial and impressed current systems in terms of their redox reactions. So both systems use redox reactions to make the steel structure the cathode. Okay, So that's just a, a similarity of both. The sacrificial anode system oxidizes the anode metal to generate electrons. Okay, So it actually uses uh, like a re an oxidation reaction to get rid of the anode, but to produce electrons. For zinc, we have zinc metal turning into zinc 2 plus, plus 2e, okay, two electrons. The impressed current system oxidizes the water as opposed to the anode and reduces water at the cathode as well. Okay, so, so in both cases for the impressed current system, water is the only thing that undergoes a reaction. So the anode reaction is water turns into oxygen plus hydrogen, uh, hydrogen ions, and four electrons. And since the anode is in that, only the water can be oxidized. Okay? So that's the difference. At the anode is really the key difference. Um, so the anode of a sacrificial system, um, the metal oxidizes, whereas in an impressed current system, the water oxidizes. Okay? Explain using examples how steel can be made more corrosion resistant by alloying. Okay? This is slightly, uh, slightly um, off the topic a little bit, but it's still, a good, um, still linked to the whole uh, idea of corrosion resistance. Steels can be more corrosion resistant by including corrosion resistant or passivating metals in the steel. Okay? Alloys which resist corrosion are those with a high percentage of chromium, nickel or manganese and or molybdenum. Okay? So these are all chemicals that can help build the corrosion resistance of steel. Although these alloys have improved corrosion resistance, they still need further protection. So even though we use these sort of what we call stainless steels, we still need to protect them, uh, particularly if we want to use them in sort of a high stress environment. Okay? So that concludes today's lesson on cathodic protection. We've looked at what cathodic protection is, which is just the impression of electrons onto a structure. And then we looked at what are the, some altern like what are the two alternative methods to generate cathodic protection and we looked at their advantages and disadvantages. So hopefully you can sort of uh, appreciate the, uh, the technology that goes into just keeping a steel bridge standing. Um, and so hopefully you've learned something, and I look forward to seeing you at our next lesson.